All right, in uh, chapter three, we discuss the uh, crystalline solids, uh, the regular arrangement and packing of atoms into a crystal structure. And when we, were, we spoke of this, we didn't speak about defects yet. Uh, each location within the structure had an atom, and this crystalline solid was considered infinite in size. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and consider uh, the types of defects or, or imperfections that would exist in crystalline solids. Now, one of the reasons why we're interested in this is because the defects often dominate the properties of a solid. Okay? And equally as important through processing techniques that we'll see later in uh, this textbook, uh, processing techniques can change the number and types of defects. And since they can, can change, change the number and types of defects, that is their structure, these defects can control or alter properties. We now have a direct way through processing to affect the properties of materials. All right, so there's three sort of classes or levels of imperfections that we can talk about. There's the one-dimensional, two-dimensional, and three-dimensional in terms of their extent, referred to in your text as point defects, line defects, and interfacial or surface type defects. Okay, so we'll go through each of these types in order. So we'll go ahead and take a look at the point defects. The vacancy and the interstitial will be kind of the two main categories and then we'll take a look at a few others. But here on the left side we've got a, uh, a slice through a crystal structure looking at a plane. Maybe this looks like the 100 zero for the face center cubic. So you can see the uh, face right here for the FCC structure. And now we can see that there's a missing atom. So missing atoms are simply referred to as vacancies in the structure. And we could also have the case where maybe an atom exists where it shouldn't. So it's in between atoms like this one here. This is referred to as an interstitial. These sites between the atoms are referred to as interstitial sites. This one specifically is a self-interstitial because it's an atom of the same type. So we could also talk about impurity interstitials, which would be an atom of a different type into this lattice. All right, so one thing you can see about a self-interstitial is that it's not gonna fit, right? So the way this is drawn, there's, these atoms are all overlapping. So this lattice would have to stretch out and distort in order to fit this atom right in here uh, in this site. So this is not gonna be as common as say a vacancy. The vacancies are one of the defects that are actually thermodynamically stable. So we can't get rid of them. In fact, there are a number, um, there's an equilibrium number of them that depends on the temperature of the solid. And as we approach the melting point, this uh, number of vacancies increases exponentially. And so you'll have a problem in your homework. Take a look at the number of vacancies in a solid. Uh, I'll just refer you to problem 4.1 in your textbook, which will run through a simple problem using this equation. But let's take a look at the equation for a second. This is called an Arrhenius equation. Okay, anytime you see uh, an equation of this form, where we've got an exponential of some kind of an energy barrier over KT, that's thermal energy, this Boltzmann's constant, and this is the temperature in Kelvin. So this is like a probability that we can overcome this formation energy or this barrier. You've seen this before in chemical kinetics where this was the energy for a reaction to overcome the barrier. Okay, so this is like a probability that a given site um, could be a vacancy. And then this is the number of sites that are in our given structure, say per meter cubed. And then that will give us the number of vacancies in that same volume, say meter cubed. So many times we'll just move this n over here and we'll look at simply the vacancy fraction. So the number of vacancies per atom site in a given material, vacancy fraction. 
All right, uh, let's see what else can we say. The, um, this activation energy Q we're gonna see is on the order of uh, an electron volt, so that's a convenient unit to use. So you're gonna to need to use Boltzmann's constant um, also in units of electron volts. All right, point defects in a metal or alloy continued here. So we've seen the self-interstitial and we've seen the vacancy, the missing atom case. We can also talk about these um, defects when we also have alloys. So let's say we had a, an alloy here, maybe of nickel. So we have this crystal structure here uh, of nickel. This is a face-centered cubic material. So this represents maybe a 111 plane. And then we're substituting in copper in place of some of the nickel in this lattice, okay, in these atomic sites. So this is a substitutional impurity. Okay, I'm removing the host atom, I'm substituting in a different type. So it's substitutional impurity. And this alloy is referred to as a substitutional solid solution. Now we could also take a, um, an alloy, a smaller atom, into a host and have it locate at interstitial sites. It's referred to as an interstitial impurity. A good example of this one would be carbon in iron forming a steel. So we'd have a steel structure, uh, the iron, the host, and then the carbon would sit in the interstitial sites. Okay. Now in this picture, it makes it look like it sits perfectly in here. In fact, the carbon is a little bit big, and so it does distort the lattice increases the energy of that system. And so we'll see that we can't put a whole lot of carbon into the iron because of this. If we try and push in too much, then the carbon will precipitate out of this lattice and form an iron carbide. All right, so what we wanna do is to go ahead and see if we can calculate with our knowledge of crystal structures what the size of these interstitial sites might be. So we're gonna take a look at the types of interstitial sites we have and then see if we can calculate their size. So I'm just gonna define two types in the face-centered cubic structure. Your book will describe for you the body-centered cubic structure. Uh, so if we take a look at the face-centered cubic structure, so these atoms here in blue, and I've highlighted a few of them here and talk about that in a second. But the blue are in face-centered cubic positions. Okay, you can see the centers here, faces containing the blue atoms. And then they've got a couple of other atoms, impurity atoms that are located in between sites. So there's one that's directly in the middle. And I'll talk about that one in just a second over here. We've got one sitting on this edge. Okay, so that represents a type of site that could be any of the edges. And we've got one that's sitting here that we've seen before in the diamond cubic structure, the zinc blend structure, that's sitting off of this atom by a quarter, quarter, quarter in terms of its location. And this one is the one that is in a tetrahedral site. So if I take this corner atom and the three faces neighboring faces, we will find that these three form a triangle, they're all touching, and this one's sitting on top of them, also touching, and so here's our picture. So if you want, this atom is this one here. This is our little tetrahedral atom sitting in the, in the middle in this tetrahedral site, and then we've got these other three atoms forming this base of this pyramid. And so we wanna find out what the size of this atom is that just fits in this little tetrahedral site, okay? The one in the center, if I look over here, there's a big hole in the face center cubic structure right in the center of the body. You had a position one half, one half, one half. And the, if I take the neighboring six face atoms, those are actually all touching. You can see that down here. And then there's the site right in the middle. And this is referred to as an octahedron. 
I connect all these sides, you can see here this forms a, an octahedron. So this is an octahedral site. All right, and a similar kind of site here for the edges. If we were to put on the rest of the blue lattice, we'd actually see that this is similar. And again, it forms an octahedral site. So for homework, uh, you're going to have to work on this one, the octahedral site. I'm going to go ahead and show you how to do this tetrahedral one so you can use the same method for the octahedral. All right, so um, we could use a lot of geometry if we wanted and figure out the size of the spacing in here. But I'm going to try and show you just a simpler way, just using uh, distance between points. This is essentially related to a dot product. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and take this tetrahedral atom, which is located at one quarter, three quarters, one quarter. Okay, you can see that's given here in the problem. And I need one more atom that's touching it. And so I'm just going to go ahead and take this corner one here. This is easy for us to get a coordinate from. So that's zero, one, zero. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, subtract these two. So that'll form the uh, a vector connecting these two points. So that would be one quarter, uh, three quarters minus one is minus a quarter, a quarter. All right. And the magnitude of that, so that'll be now the distance between the tetrahedral atom and the corner atom is going to be the square root of three over four. So let me go ahead and we'll grab these two atoms and see what we just did. So I've got that one. I've got this big one they're touching. This is little r, and the center here is big R. And so um, what I do know is that the distance between these now is square root 3r, but I have to remember that I need to multiply by a, because right? this work up here was done relative to the edge length of our unit cell. This is just fractional. But if I want to actually start putting the size of atoms into this structure, then I want to use the real dimension. So I'm going to multiply by a, the length here, so I can get real coordinates. So what I have then is little r plus big R here is equal to the square root of 3 over 4 times a. And you'll recall that for the face-centered system, I hope, that the edge length a is given by four times the radius of the host here uh, over the square root of two. All right, so if we just go ahead and rearrange, I'm gonna get r, uh, little r over r is equal to the square root of three over the square root of two minus one. Okay. And put that in my calculator and I get 0 0.225. Okay, so what does that mean? So if I have the radius of my host, let's say that it's um, iron, I can go ahead and put the radius of iron in here and approximately two tenths of that iron radius would be the radius, the maximum radius of my interstitial that would just fit into this tetrahedral site uh, without needing any extra room. Okay? Now it's not the maximum size of an of a interstitial atom that can fit um, in, in uh, when I say real life, because you can fit bigger ones in there, they'll just distort the lattice. Uh, but by distorting the lattice, I won't be able to put as many into the overall structure. Uh, if they are small enough to just fit inside the interstitials without stretching the lattice, then I can get a lot more of them uh, into the structure. Okay. But this is the size of this hole 
that is in the structure. And what you're gonna have for homework to do would be this one, this is gonna be much bigger in size, you'll, you'll see. And again, you can use the same kind of method. Um, you're given the, the, the coordinates for the center atom here, and all you need is just one of these face atoms because they're all touching, and you can go through the same type of procedure. Okay, um, that's all I have for now. We'll continue on to the next video um, in this chapter.